All right, folks, today we have Jonathan Goodman on the show. Uh, and uh, really, the, the reason I brought him on is because uh, my former business partner, Doug Larson, said I should have Jonathan on the show. And when, when Doug says that, I go, OK. And um, he's usually right. Usually, usually right. We'll see. We'll see today. So uh, <laughs> uh, we have Jonathan Goodman on. And you've been teaching people how to do uh, online coaching uh, for, for quite a while. Um, and, you know, right now in the coaching industry, everybody's going online, uh, whether they wanted to or not. And, a lot, you know, I've noticed a lot of people uh, come to us and they're going like, well, I was thinking about going online. You know, I wish I would have done it before, but I guess, I, you know, a lot of people had the fire lit under their ass and mm -hmm. it's been really good for them. A lot of people have been struggling. Uh, and one of the things that just in the pre-show, the, the, the three minutes we chatted before we hit record, you, you talked about, you know, why virtual training is a joke and going away. So I do want to dig into that uh, because a lot of people are uh, liking the virtual training as coaches, but it's likely not sustainable is what I'm hearing from you. Um, well, I mean, virtual training and virtual coaching are two entirely different things. Got it. Got S it. What? Sitting on a camera, you know, with, with a client or a few clients across from you on the screen is not virtual coaching. Yeah. Um, it, it does not do online training, online coaching justice. Got and it. there's absolutely nothing to differentiate you between you and any app or anything that Silicon Valley is going to come out with you know, pick your poison, mirror, Peloton, whatever, or like a company like Beachbody. Um, right now it's fine because nobody's working. And when nobody's working, you can easily do classes throughout the day because nobody's working. Yeah. But once people start going back to work, trying to organize in the home classes where everybody has to show up at the same time, it's like, eh -eh, that ain't going to work. And the other part of it is just that it's not really much fun for most people. I mean, it's just everything you get out of an in-person interaction is gone. Yeah. Well, there's a lot <laughs> of, so, I think a lot of people like it uh, or I, I've watched some people stop liking it. Like the novelty of it was really exciting. It's like, oh, I'm home I'm go somewhere. And so the novelty is exciting, but the novelty I've witnessed is starting to wear off. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm tired of being on camera leading a class. Uh, this way all the time in my living room. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, what you can do by leveraging technology nowadays, I can tell you how we're doing it, Yeah. but what you can do when you leverage technology nowadays is you can offer a better coaching service that's more convenient and a more cost-effective price point to your clients while making more yourself with a better schedule yourself than you ever could. It doesn't mean you have to get away from the gym. Yeah. Like this is an evolution. There, there's, there's a couple of surprises. So for anybody who doesn't know me, I run the personal trainer development center. We've published over a thousand articles. We've got a few million people a year on that. It's the largest blog for trainers. And then in 2013, I created the precursor to what's become the online trainer Academy, which is the first ever certification for online trainers in yeah. 2013. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, we've been doing this for seven and a half years, yeah. over 30, yeah. over 30,000 people, like 87 countries um, that, that we've accessed. So like, this is not us figuring this out in the last three weeks. Yeah. Because um, cause we've had to. And what, what often surprises people is two facts about online training that we've noticed with all of our students um, over these years. And one is the majority of trainers who coach clients online never coach a client outside of their city, which is interesting. Happy to talk well, about that. Most coaches that, that coach online are not coaching outside of their city. No, they're all of their clients are in the same city as them. But they're training them online. They're training them online. Think about, think about conventional is that, training. Is that new? Or are you talking about this before COVID? This is before COVID. This is now. Okay. This, is, this was okay. always. Okay. Absolutely, there are people who train people in different countries, for sure. Yeah. But what do you think about, like, as a trainer, you don't actually need that many clients, that many customers. I mean, to, I mean, to make $72,000 a year, you need yep. 30 clients paying you $200 a month. Yeah. Like, like you need 30 customers, right? Yeah. It's, it's not... Obviously, if you want to go beyond that, I mean, you can do the math, you can figure out how many it is, but you don't actually need that many people. Any trainer worth their salt that's gotten some results with people in the gym, well, now they're able to expand their pool of referrals outside of 
people who live 15 minutes from my facility. It's like, I'm from yep. Toronto. Traffic is a nightmare. If a client didn't live 10 minutes in the gym, they weren't coming at 6 yeah. PM, 7 PM. Yeah. It just ain't happening. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I had a client who's 45 minutes away. Well, they saw me once every two weeks on Saturday morning at 8 AM. This is like eight years ago, right? Nine years ago. They'd see me once every two weeks at 8 AM on Saturday because they couldn't drive to me that much. And so this was a client who I just did a workout for at the time. I didn't know about online training. And yeah. so, you know, I wasn't charging them for anything in between. I wasn't offering them that good of a service. I was just seeing them for that one session. Well, now what you could do is you could take on any of those referrals. You can work with clients who are outside of that immediate vicinity, which means friends, family members, loved ones, people who go to church with your clients, <laughs> like whatever it is, you can take them on. Well, most of your clients, most of their contacts are going to live in the same city. Yeah. So it's just, it just so happens that it expands that way. And then, um, and then you can decide whether you train them fully online or what, what most people do. Like most trainers, I'm a bit weird cause I'm more introverted, but most trainers are pretty extroverted. Like they actually like to be around people, which is yeah. weird for me, but yeah. <laughs> they like to be around people. And so what they do then is um, they do this hybrid approach, right? Basically, the way that we were all brought up in the fitness industry was a way where, where fitness was dictated by business. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the natural constraints of the business model of a gym limited our ability to optimize the service that we were giving to our clients. Yeah. How so? Like, how's it limiting? You have to show up exactly at 8 a.m. Yeah. Or you miss five minutes of your workout. Yeah. Right? As a trainer, our job is to remove stress from our clients' lives, not add to it. So my client, who's the chief of psychiatry at a major hospital in Toronto that sees me every Tuesday and Thursday at 4.30 p.m., shows up at 4.40 because there's an emergency in the psych ward and rushes in and is stressed out because he's going to miss 10 minutes of his workout. Like, yeah. that is not a good service to be able to offer to somebody. Yeah. Um, that's one. The second is, you know this, Mike, like a perfect workout is never exactly 30 minutes or an hour long. Yeah. So... If, and, and, and over the course of a client's life cycle, that changes, right? A hypertrophy worker. Or even might from day to, to day. You know? It might so change from day in, to day. They come in tired. I'm, I don't want to train you for an hour. I don't want to train you tired, for an hour. Like, like, we'll stretch out for a bit. We'll move a bit. But, you know, let's, let's chill the fuck out. Let's yeah. chill out. Okay, now you're ready to hit it hard. Now you want to put on some muscle. Well, you know what? You need now in 15 to get the volume in. Okay. Yeah. Well, too bad. Because I got hour sessions. Okay, now you want to do more of a metabolic workout with 40, 45 minutes. Ah, but you're paying for an hour. We're going to do tricep pull downs or some shit for 15 minutes just to waste the last, the end of the time. Yeah. Like, put your hand up if you've done that, you know, as yeah. a trainer. Um, and, you know, we're just going to stretch your hamstrings again. Like, I don't know. So it just doesn't, our job as, as fitness professionals, as coaches, whether you work with clients one on one or in a, in a CrossFit group training type, situation is to optimize things for clients. That's literally all that we're paid for. Yeah. And a conventional business model, the book and mortar studio is simply, it's simply not set up. It's constraint. What, what online or what hybrid allows you to do is it allows you to reverse that continuum. So now fitness can dictate business. You can now give a client exactly what they need, how they need it, when they need it, where they need it. That might mean that they come and see you in the gym at this point of their training twice a week, three times a week. Yeah. But a month from now, that might mean that they tone it back and see you once every two weeks for a form check, or they just like seeing you once every two weeks or whatever. So they're getting a full package. So they're, they're getting a package. I mean, this is what we talk about is like, you know, and this is one of the biggest frustrations for most coaches, gym owners, trainers is, yeah, I, I have my clients for an hour or two hours or three, four hours a week, but the clients are doing a bunch of dumb shit the rest of the time <laughs> that are unwinding all the results. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, are, are you suggesting creating a, a package that, that also addresses lifestyle? Well, I mean, first off to take a step back, you don't even know the dumb shit that they're doing in between. Yeah. Because your payment structure doesn't allow you to do the work to actually monitor well, you're what you're doing about, in between. You're talking about an yeah. hourly. You're talking about an hourly rate. Like, like I'm talking idea, about like an hourly rate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the hourly rate is highly limiting. 
Mm-hmm. So for these, these are for the coaches who are, are selling packages that are for hourly. And you're suggesting selling packages that are more like a coaching package. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Yes and no. It could be a coaching package. What we generally recommend, I mean, this is just one of the models. There's a lot of different ones, but one of the models that's most popular that we recommend is a hybrid model, which is basically an hourly rate plus a coaching package. Mm-hmm. So you do both. So if they see you in person, they pay you hourly rate. Yeah. Okay. Right? But then there's a coaching package. So it's actually outside. divided up. I see. Okay. It's actually divided up. I mean, you can sell it as a bundle, but it's actually divided yeah. up. And that way, I mean, a client could see you as much or as little as they want. But the but perhaps even more important and notable for that is coaches need to show up where coaches need to show up and get the hell out of the way when coaches don't need to be there. Because there's a lot of things that technology and computers and automation and software can do way better than humans. One thing that it can't do better than humans is coach. One thing that it will never be able to do better than humans is coach. That's why Silicon Valley will never replace personal trainers. Because a coach, somebody who cares for you, somebody who's in your corner, somebody who understands motivational interviewing, somebody who is able to ask the right questions, you can't ever replace that. But what you can do is you can get software to do your scheduling for you, right? You can get software to check in with your clients and see how they're feeling. To be honest, most coaches, and this is going to rub a lot of people the wrong way, but Software can build better programs than most coaches can build these days too. Software can't individualize the programs, but you can actually use, build a really intelligent bank of templates and use that as your base and then come in just at the last little bit and individualize it for a client. Yeah. That's actually probably better than what most coaches are doing when they're probably every yeah. new program from scratch. Yeah. So, so this is what I mean about like, yeah, there's two packages, but it goes deeper than that because it comes down to saying, okay, what is technology better at than humans and what is it not? And how can we remove humans from the process as much as possible in order to optimize yeah. where humans well, need lot, to be? I see a lot of coaches. I mean, I've been dealing with this for uh, for years was, hey, you've been uh, in it you've been in this for i think about the same amount of time you have and it's like yeah i remember uh uh teaching people about email automation you know i remember when like all right it like, was magic you know, yeah yeah magic. well here, here's the thing is and then coaches would come back and or gym owners and they go why well, i don't want to do email automation i go well why not what's well, so impersonal like mm-hmm. you know the, so on and so forth i'm like i'm like that actually frees you up to have more time with your clients because you're spending less time drafting individualized emails to each single person, which right. you're not going to do anyway. So it's actually doing something you wouldn't be doing anyway. And, you know, and, you know, I saw it and you probably saw it. I was like, yeah, like email automation is becoming normalized. Right. You know, I remember the day I, I, I remember the days of like sending, uh, having my automation running and having a, a member of the gym walk in and go, man, that email you sent me today, like, oh, oh yeah, spot on. Da, da, da. And I'm like, what the fuck are they talking? Oh, yeah, oh, the man. automation, the aut- a Weber. Oh yeah. Like, uh, I had no idea. Oh yeah. yeah. We get, we get a hundred, 200 replies back to every email thanking us for sending them that message back yeah. in the day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Back in the day. And it's like, oh wow. <laughs> Mike was thinking about me today. I appreciate yeah, it. Right. Mike was thinking uh, about me and 20,000 other people today. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the day when we got 80% open rates on emails. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Beautiful here's the thing. thing is people were, now it would be si- silly if you're a coach and you go, well, of course I do automated email, you know, mm. of course. But then there's, there's probably some other technological advance that, that we have at our disposal. We go, well, I don't want to use that because it's not personal, but in five years it'll be normalized. Well, let me, let me, let me tell you one of the examples. Cause, cause we we do this with our students in our education programs and we're actually launching our own online fitness coaching pretty soon too. Funny seven and a half years into teaching people how to do it. We're launching our own. Yeah. And, um, and, and one of the things that we're building out into it is automated check-ins because automated check-ins are as simple as could be a text message. We're doing it within the software that we're using, but Really, we're, we're effectively randomizing. The, the way that we're structuring it is 
you know, we're starting with 100 clients, we'll take on 500 new clients every three months. And so we have at the beginning 20 clients per coach, we'll have 50 clients per coach, ultimately, I think. But then each coach has all of their clients split into teams of five. So at the beginning, each coach will train four teams of five people. And so the messages will go to the team of five people. And there will be individualized workouts, individualized messaging, but then most of the accountability and teamwork and stuff like that will, will go to the team. Anyway, so we have, as part of the follow-up ongoing check-in system and accountability messages, we have a randomizer. So we have 50 or 60 check-in messages oh, and wow. we have a randomizer sending them to people. And it's literally things like, hey, how'd you sleep last night from one to five? Hey, how's your stress levels? Because really all that we're doing there is we're identifying places where we need to show up. It also raises the awareness right. of the client. I mean, I know that um, I have a buddy who's got a training program I've been participating in. And it's like, you know, how's your sleep? How are you feeling? Like, how many hours did you get? Like mm -hmm. five, five questions Yep. before the training program. And, you know, if, if I didn't already have a practice, which most people don't have some type of practice of checking in on themselves, no meditation or anything. And I get that message. I go, oh, shit, I am tired. You know, I'm going to give myself some grace today. And yeah. And of course, you know, that's being taught through the program because when you put in, I only got six hours of sleep last night, it goes, well, we're going to go easy today. And then you're probably going to go to sleep a little bit earlier that night. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's actually, I didn't even think about that, but I think that's a great note. I, I think about this always from the coach's perspective, right? And like, yeah. if, if somebody's not sleeping well, or if you do, like, we've got like a traffic light check-in system, are you, you know, are you a green, yellow, or red? And, yeah. And, and then a couple of questions. And all that that allows you to do is somebody says they're green and stuff's going good. You can send them a quick thumbs up, but somebody says I'm a red or I'm a yellow. It's like, cool. <clears> what can we do to get you to green? Yeah. Or, I mean, we, you know, and I know, right. Sleep is an indicator of poor recovery. Usually sleep is an indicator of like a bunch of stuff going yeah. badly. If it's not going well, somebody's stressed, somebody's not eating well, like that's where a coach shows up and they're just like, yo, Mike, let's talk. But a yeah. coach doesn't need to reach out to every single one of his or her clients yeah. multiple times a week. The, the initial messages that help you identify whether you need to show up as a coach would can be automated. Yeah. And that, that's, that to me is one of the really, really cool things that technology allows you to do where, yeah, like we have one of the best trainers in the world building a bank of templates of programs for clients who fit into very specific categories. Yep. And we're not taking clients that don't fit into these categories. And then we built an intelligent enough intake that matches with the programs. Yeah. I mean, this, so is, once, this, is, this is where everything's going is yeah. you, you niche down far enough and you create a program that you know 99% of the time is going to get this type of person, this type yeah. of result. And that's, yeah. that's going to duplicate in the world to where so. every, everyone, everyone has, there will be an answer for everybody. Yep. Like, oh, this is me. This is where I'm starting. This is where I want to go. It's like, well, this is the perfect program for you. Exactly. So we're actually building our intake with that. And, we're, and the company that the development company that we're working with, we have a weak leg between where we cut off registrations for every three month cohort to when we give people the programs. Basically, we actually have a 10 day lag and people have three days to fill in their intakes. Somebody fills in their intake. Okay, cool. They told us that they're, um, they have this goal. They're advanced based off of whatever we said. Um, they have these equipment, they have this equipment availability and they can train four days a week. Okay. They get program 17, yeah. right? That program is then preloaded by our development team into this person's account. The coach then goes into the account, takes a look at the intake and fine tunes it specifically to them. And then the client logs in and basically checks it out and says, okay, cool. Like this is, this is good for me or Hey, let's talk about this a little bit more. But you see how that just like immediately now you could offer incredible programs to clients. You could take almost none of the coach's time and you can do it to the client for less money than they would pay for anywhere close to that. I mean, you know, the trainer that we're working with that's building the programs will charge 300 bucks an hour to see him in person. Yeah. <laughs> like you would have trained with him for three months. It cost you what, 10, 12,000 bucks? Yeah. Not more. Um, so no, we're close to that. So you can, you can do these things intelligently in, in a really, really neat way. 
So where should be, where should coaches be putting their attention? It's like, okay. Um, I mean, th- this is the way I see it is we have, uh, four different categories of labor. Uh, so this is my old coach. He, he wrote a book uh, called the last safe investment and it takes like 20, I think 21 or 22 different skills you could develop as a human being. They create value in the world. So the, the, the idea is the last safe investment that the, or the most safe investment is to invest in yourself, right. And the skills yeah. that other people value. Um, and uh, if you go through this list, most people lack, the majority of the skills listed in this book. <laughs> right. Uh, what, what's an example or two that you think so that people like, are lacking? Well, well, um, well, it depends on the category. So he splits up into four different categories. You have physical labor. So it's from right. lowest to highest. So physical labor is, you know, the only people who get paid a shitload of money doing physical labor are professional athletes, right? Okay. Uh, but everyone else that they're on the low end, there's always outliers. Right. And then, then, then there's the technician, there's technical ability. These are accountants. These are, uh, programmers to a degree. These are, these are, uh, people who do, they have technical skills cool. that are, uh, whatever. And then you have creative skills. Now, these are graphic designers. This is problem solvers. This is, you know, musicians, uh, there's this creative aspect. And then you have people at the highest level is interpersonal skill. And so uh, this would be leadership, sales, so on and so forth. And so uh, basically, you know, after I read the book and I'm looking at the landscape, I'm going, okay, well, robots are going to do all the physical stuff, (laughs) right? Like the gardening, uh, the, the building of homes, like that's becoming, that's becoming more automated. And in fact, there's, you know, there's some people that think that there's a lot of purposeful, uh, diminishment of technology because we can't put people out of work too fast, like self-driving cars and buses. Like we can't have self-driving cars yet because that would put 40,000 truck drivers out of business overnight. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like, there's this jobs are important. That's like a, that's a narrative that's running in, in our culture. And, and you know, that actually, when I say that people get triggered, you know, jobs are important because, and then, you know, all these reasons, uh, purpose and all that, but, um, like you can't have purpose without a job. Uh, but, uh, the, uh, uh, the technical skills are obviously being, they're being replaced with software. It's like uh, bookkeeping had went from pen and paper to QuickBooks and, and you know, right. it, it's done a lot better and pretty soon, like, it'll just be automated. So it, we is, have, it is to a large extent. Oh, I mean, oh, yeah. we have a bookkeeper and financial controller and accountant and everything like that. But the reason why our financial expenses are not as high as they are is we've created algorithms and yeah. when we actually price our products, I mean, there's no way that you would know this or like anybody else would notice this, but we never have two products that cost the same amount. Yep. Because part of the algorithm is if person pays $47, categorize as this, which means book it as this, put it on, yep. you know, in the, in the chart of accounts, everything, of course, is number. And, and, and so that's automated. Like our yeah. bookkeeper probably, I mean, we'll do... 50, 75,000 sales every year. And our bookkeeper will need to do like 20 or 30 a month manually. Yeah. You know, it's just, yeah, exactly. It's basically already there. So it's like I, anyone who's in a, in a physical labor or technical skill, they need to upgrade quick. They need to get into learning a creative or interpersonal skills. Mm. And even a lot of things that are considered creative skills are, are going to, are actually technical skills and they're going away. Like you were talking about the program design, having the templates and, and all that. And, you know, there's always an art involved in that, but you're going to, it's going to be largely automated. And so the way I see it is, is the way technology is moving is labor, like physical labor, technical labor, and then even create a lot of creative labor is going to be done away with. And really all that's going to be left unless, you know, there's a, a true, apocalypse uh <laughs> there you know unless you know the the terminator shows up uh then what we have is mostly people with interpersonal skills and so i mean what do you think what, what do you think about that idea and inside of that idea 
what uh where should coaches be and trainers be focusing their energy on development i took a lot of notes as you were as you were talking about that so um that's cool because that gives me a lot to think about. That's why I love doing these things. I love talking about people because there's there's so much to unpack there, right? Like the four categories of skills, the physical, the technical ability, the creative, the interpersonal. Um, super interesting. One one thing, one quote that jumped up that, uh, that I immediately thought about is like an old school Earl Nightingale quote. You know, one of the earliest leadership coaches, self-development coaches, I think he's born, what does it say here? Like 1921, I think it is. Yeah, 1921, he's born. So just to, to prove that nothing is new and, and, and history repeats itself, mm-hmm. okay? Earl Nightingale said, the money we, we, the money we receive will always be in a direct ratio to the demand for what we do, our ability to do it, and the difficulty in replacing us. Mm. That's basically what you said. Yeah. Right. Nothing is new. How difficult is it to replace you? Well, if it's easy to replace you, the money you receive is actually going to be very small. And and we've actually built this into our coaching program, going back to our coaching program. Then I'll talk about like this idea of what has value and not. So we're starting with five coaches and, and with the plan to scale it up to 20, 30, 40 within the first three or four months. And we're actually paying the coaches very little very, very little for the first three months that they work with a client. Yeah. For one simple reason, they're expendable. We are providing the programs. We're providing all of the messages we're sending to the people. We're providing all of the marketing, all of the client acquisition. They're coming in and taking care of the clients really well. And then renewing the client. The minute that a client renews, they're paid doubles. Yeah. Because at that point now, they've provided a really valuable service. Yeah. And so if you think about like where and and how to make money in the industry, like what can you do in order to not be expendable? Yeah. Um, You know, why do doormen still exist in New York City? Why are there more doormen now than there was five years ago? That is the easiest task to replace ever. Open a door, close a door. It is not hard to automate that. There are buttons, there are sensors, and yet there's more doorman now than there was five years ago in New York City. Well, think about all the other services that a doorman does, right? And, and so the doorman, of course, gives you instructions on where to go, but it's more than that. It's, it's the allure of living in a building with a doorman, right? Building managers, development companies know that they can charge more for their apartments because of the prestige of having a doorman in that building. Oh yeah. My friend and I were looking at a condo a few weeks ago and it was just, oh yeah, you have a 24 seven concierge. It's like, pff, awesome. Which, Amazing. Like, it's like having a doorman. Yep. Yep. With it's a different convenient. name. Sounds fancier. <laughs> Doorman's fancier. They wear like a that is know, fancier. They wear uniform and everything <laughs> like that. No, it is. It is. But there's, there's the prestige, right? And then of course there's the convenience, you know, they can accept packages and stuff like mm-hmm. that, which is actually super funny in condos now. Cause they're like, all of the concierges are just, there's just like a wall of packages. In front a of wall of face. Amazon behind them. Oh yeah. My God. I feel so bad for these guys and girls, man. There's just nothing they can do. They're just buried because none of these condos were built to accept that many deliveries. No. So there's no. no storage. There's nothing for it. Um, but anyway, so so that's just a good example of like what what Silicon Valley does. You know, you look at like the acquisition of Mirror that just happened by uh, by Lululemon or Peloton, of course, has taken off. Or like every time that there's a new app or AI that's like a fitness AI, there's all these sensationalistic articles. Like, is this the end of personal training? It's like, no. The reality of it is what Silicon Valley does is they will always, they'll always break down a task or a problem into every single one of its parts, rip out all the unnecessary ones and automate or build, build software to accomplish all of the basic tasks. They remove a lot of the real intrinsic value though. And so if you want to compete as a personal trainer, if you want to compete in the fitness industry, you need to really understand where that intrinsic value is And you got to maximize that. The allure of online training is not so you can sit with your feet up on a beach. 
It's not location independence. It's none of that. The allure of online training is that now finally we can use technology and automation to remove ourselves from all of the things that we should never have been doing in order to maximize where we need to show up and do that stronger and in greater capacity to more people. That to me is a really exciting thing. Yeah. And so, so the idea then is you got to understand as a coach, what are those things? And we're in a moment now where there's going to be a lot of fighting back and forth. I told people to start using workout templates and basically build templates and work off of them. I told people to do this nine years ago in a book that I wrote. I got hate, man. Holy crap, I got hate. And I just made a logical argument. I'm like, if you have a client who fits into a specific category and you write the absolute best workout that you could ever write for that client, and then you have another client who fits into a very similar category, by definition, writing another brand new workout is going to be the second best workout you could write for that client. Yeah. Why not continually improve the best workout Right. And that template and then individualize that and just yeah. always work to make that better and better and better and understand who's that's for and who's that's not for. Yeah, I, I would say the majority of trainers, definitely that's true for. I would say the only exception is and like we have a lot of clients who are uh, like a lot of high skill uh, type of training. So it's yeah, not 100%. it's not, you know, it, 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 it works really well if you're talking about CrossFit, bodybuilding, you know, weight loss clients, you know, muscle building clients. That's like very, very true. But then like you get into one of these niche categories like uh, mace training, you know, <laughs> and, like which we have a lot of clients who do the mace. And it's like it's really? so much. Yeah, it's so much skill. Uh and it's so much practice and it's actually more like martial arts than it yep. is say training. So it's, uh, you know, when, when I'm hearing you talk, I go, yes, this is very true. If you're the type of personal trainer who's doing like, you're going to do this many sets and this many reps, but that's, we have a lot of coaches that we train that that's really not even what they do anymore. It's yeah. like, it's like, Oh, I could give you that, but we're actually going to be doing, which is what we're talking about is, they're offering something that's got like this entrant, this value. Yeah. There's human connection happening. There's a back and forth and, um, and it can be done inside of a group and it can be done one-on-one -on -one. and maybe you're on your own for a week and then you come in and you have a meeting and you talk about how it went or you, you videoed your new flow and you submit that right. and there's conversations. I'm about fascinated it. by that. I got to go watch YouTube for some base. I've done a bunch of club bell stuff. Yep. And oh, I did, yeah. I did competition kettlebell lifting. Yeah. For a while. This, this so is a whole, that. a whole different animal. So okay. I'm okay. with you. Tell I'm with you. It. Cause I did this stuff. Right. Uh, you know, I come from weightlifting and CrossFit. It's very, uh, I came from like the hard sports, right? The hard, mm. you know, if you did kettlebell sport is it's a hard, hard style. It's a hard style training. You it know, is not fun. <laughs> those, strong those man, ten power lifting, sets. weightlifting. Yeah. These are all hard style training. And most people that come from a hard style background don't even realize that there's a non hard, hard, you know, there's a soft style training and they usually just look at soft style training and go, that's dumb. Uh, yeah. But then you get into a softer style or a more feminine style, which would be something like mace flow. Mm -hmm. And so it's not even about uh, it, it. It's, it's more like you you're learning the dance moves and then you're learning the dance with a weight. But then like uh, one, uh, one of my friends, she's a yoga, uh, a yoga instructor. She's a yogi. She has a 200 hour teacher uh, training program. She's super mm -hmm. high level, never held a mace in her hands, put a mace in her hands a couple of days ago. And she caught on really quick because she has the body awareness, the mirror, neurons, all this stuff. And uh, and it was it. She goes, oh, this is like yoga with weights because it's like <laughs> match the breath with the movement. But then it's like, well, what movement do you want to do? Whatever you want to do, you know, and it's and it's you don't always do just the things you feel like doing. But there's there are things like that happening in the fitness industry. Now, yeah. I said it, it's, just, it's a small niche. And you're talking it, about choreography, though. I mean, that's yeah. awesome. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So there's so be, I and. 
I think a lot of this would never, it definitely wouldn't have existed without all this automation. Yeah. And so what we're going to, I think what we're going to see is because of all this automation, there's now this explosion of creativity, right? We have yes. the physical labor, the technical labor. I don't have to worry about technical shit anymore. So now my mind, more of my capacity is going into creativity. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that I'm witnessing in the market is just coaches coming out with shit I never dreamt of before. Mm. And here's the thing. I'm 38. I've been, I've been lifting weights since I was 15. And I, I've been bored before, you know, I was like, I don't know if I want to do more of that same movement my whole life. And then a lot of this new, these new styles of training came on and a lot of people see it and judge it and kind of think it looks silly. But it, once, once yeah. I got into it myself, I'm like, I'll be one of those silly motherfuckers. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> like my body feels good. I look good. Chicks dig me. I'm into it. Like that's, I mean, that's why we train, right? You know, it's, that's why we so started we, to train. We, yeah, I'm, like, I'm a little bit I, different I now. I'm, I'm I'm married. I got a three year old. It's, <laughs> I mean, I want my I want my wife to dig me, but I want to be able to exactly I, tell, you, tell you what it is. I want to be that dad. Good. I yeah. I love the fact that I'm that dad, and this is like super egocentric of me, and I hate myself for it. But I just know what like I'm that dad in the park throwing my kid up in the air as he's going higher, 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 higher. And all the other kids are running up to me and they want to turn. Yeah. And I look to their parents and ask them if it's okay. And then I start chucking their kids up <laughs> and the other parents can't do it. Yeah. yeah. Like that's why I train. You don't want to be the parent on the sideline. You want to be the yeah. parent in the game, you know, uh, that's, that's, it. that's important. You got to know your why, you know, but when you're, yeah, when you're a young man, it's about picking up chicks and then, Oh, that's how it always was. You that's always how it wanted, always was when I started. Always. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, then you evolve and like, I want to feel good and I want to be able to do shit and yep. I want to be able to play with kids and, and but all I think, that. I think your point yeah. of the, of the programs is, is a perfect one. I'm glad that you jumped in on that actually, because it's true. Like high performing clients. No, it's not for them. Like, right. That's a whole different beast. Anybody who you want to put on a stage, anybody who you want to put on a podium, anybody who you want to try to win a championship, like, get ready for a combine, anything like that. No, this doesn't apply to them. But the majority of clients that work in our gyms, the majority of, of people that pay the bills in the fitness industry, like I would go so far as to say 97 to 98% of oh, yeah. them fit into this category. I mean, well, even the, the highest performing athletes usually cause the most amount of problems and pay the least amount of money. In, ex that's in, exactly in what I was going to say. <laughs> it's like, I remember I, I was, I was training some uh, people for the CrossFit games at one point And then, I woke up one day and I'm like, this is not satisfying at all. It's not fun. Like, like, like I, I get way more satisfaction out of helping someone get off their diabetes medication. That, that yeah. was like the first time that happened. I'm like, Oh, that feels fucking good. I want to <laughs> do that. I want more of that. Fuck podiums. You know? right. But yeah. that's, that's the sexiness thing. I mean, even celebrities too. Like I, you know, a lot of trainers go through that when you get into the industry, you want to do these things, but like they don't, they also don't pay bills. I mean, truthfully, you know, so my, I, I trained Canada's top jazz singer for four years or something like that. And it's like, yeah, great. She was a great client. She was amazing. Like I loved her. And, and, you know, she worked with me 10 30 AM Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then she'd go and tour Japan for three months. And now I don't have a client Monday, Wednesday, Friday. She'd pay anything anymore. But when she came back, I had to have her spot again. Yep. Yep. You know, I get a kid ready for the NHL draft or the NHL combine. Because I'm Canadian, of course, so it's hockey. Yeah. And uh, and great, he crushes it. He's a second line center for the Toronto Maple Leafs right now, making eight million bucks a year. Amazing. I trained him for three months to get him ready for the combine, and then he was gone off to play college. <laughs> like, yeah. To yeah. fill that spot. I mean, it's just anybody who who has a facility that like trains high performing athletes will tell you that the majority of their money still comes from general population. And I think I think it actually brings up a really interesting point because. This is a big, I find a lot of really like super passionate people in the fitness industry that maybe don't do as well as they should be doing. And they're frustrated by it. A lot of it is because they fall into this fallacy where they feel like they need to make the majority of their money from the people that they want to help the most. Mm -hmm. And, and to tell you, to kind of explain or give you a metaphor of like why it's a fallacy. Um, if, if you consider this, like if you're really passionate about dental hygiene in third world countries, completely like off the wall example to illustrate this and you really want to donate a lot of toothbrushes to third world countries you don't need to start a toothbrush company you need to start any company in the world 
that makes a metric fuck ton of money so that you can buy as many toothbrushes as possible that you then donate to the world countries, yeah. right? It doesn't have to be connected. So if you really love doing mace flows, you don't need to make the majority of your money working with clients who are interested in mace flows. I mean, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but you don't necessarily have to. And, um, and that's, that's just one example, but we see that we have a lot of trainers who really want to work with, with underprivileged aspects yep. of our society, yep. you know, low income owners, that type of thing. And they can't make ends meet. It's like, so take on a few affluent clients, get them to pay yep. your bills yep. and then donate your time or create like low end services or, 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 or cheaper services. And those high those end people. clients may want to help in some way. So like, Completely. by the way, you know, I half my time I spend doing this. Do you want to donate or yeah. whatever? You know? I just wrote. I just wrote a letter to our. We haven't sent it out yet, but I just wrote a letter to our community, which um, is kind of my story. And uh, one of the lines that I wrote in it, I couldn't even believe that I wrote it. It was like, you know, when you write something, you write a marketing company, and you write something, you're like, "Fuck, that's true for me." Oh yeah, and that hit me hard. And, Most of and what I line, say is for me, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, the line that I wrote was, uh, I used to love going to the gym until I started working there. Yeah. And, and the minute that I wrote that, I was like, holy shit. And, uh, and it's like, if you, and not to say that, I mean, there's, it's, it's not the first person to say that, like, don't work, don't make money from your passion. I mean, and I don't know if I 100% believe that. I think that you can make money from your passion. I think that you could still be happy doing that. But um, if you're super passionate about, like, perhaps a smaller niche, like for your example, mace training or mace flows, which I still need to YouTube because I'm super interested by it. Check you out know, uh, Leo Savage. Leo, L-E-O? Yep, L-E-O uh, Savage. Got yeah. it. Instagram, uh, YouTube, you'll, you'll enjoy. The, I'll, guy, I'll enjoy the guy's it. entertaining. It's just, I mean, that stuff when you see it, like I, I, I think, I'm thinking of Capoeira right now. Yeah. Like just that like beautiful flowing movement where you try to attempt this, you're like, I can't, do it. And these people are just like, it's like water. Exactly. exactly. Uh, that's, that's what I'm imagining in my head. And then and throw course, a 10 pound mace in bells. there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like I said, I've used, I've used club bells a fair bit when I was living in Costa Rica a couple years back. Um, we were training in like this like jungle workout thing in this dude's backyard um, named Ricardo. And he, uh, he, he trained in the tack fit system. So it was like the tack fit club bell stuff. Yeah. If, if, if you know about that. And um yeah, I mean, watching him train was incredible. I mean, he'd have he'd have a 10, 15 pound club bell and just the way this thing would move. I'd do it and it would be like, ow, I'd just, just be like cranking myself. I have bruises yeah. all over my back and my shoulders and everything. But um, so I get it. But but yeah, you don't need to make the majority of your money from that. Yeah. Right? Like you yeah. can love it and just like have it as this thing you do that you do yeah, with your buddies. I, I've definitely watched people get into what they love and then you're like, oh, I don't want to make money at that. I, and I go back and forth on that too, because I think that most people who don't love it don't make the money that they thought they were going to make at it. Mm. It's like, oh, I, I love it. Or, or somehow they're perceiving work as a burden. You know, a lot of times they think that work, you know, their, their corporate gig feels like a burden, but if I, if I do a different work, it won't feel like a burden. And then realizing that, no, you're just your perspective of, uh, of yourself in the world is that work is a burden. And that's something you probably learned from one of your parents and you can drop that story and it doesn't matter what you're doing. Um, and, but I, I, I mean, I'm a firm believer in, and you, uh, this is where becoming a good businessman or businesswoman comes in handy is you can make money in a passion. So like for me, like I, I reverse, I do things the opposite of most business people. I think most people look at the, the monetary possibility first i look at what is it that i want to do and then how how good i am at business is going to dictate how much money i'm going to make at it and so like let's get creative about the model like i want to like like leo leo savage i worked with him and he was doing workshops and he was doing all sorts of stuff by where's the, he from where's the located he's in austin texas so okay. he was that's a good place mexico. to be for something like that well he's in new mexico yeah. when we started he moved to austin after okay. um and now he has a level one and level two certification. So, and he has an entire staff and he has, so, 
and then he teaches a class like once a day because he loves it at, at right. a gym. And he's he's developing. He's got a lot of free time because he 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 uh, did a good job of building out a good business model. And now he's doing a lot of really creative stuff that's that's cutting edge. And he's right. got this whole community around him. And that's so cool. it, it's like. For, to me, it's like, yeah, do what you're passionate about, but be smart at business. You can't, you can't do what you're passionate about and just copy what everyone else is doing. It's not going to work. Yep. Yeah. I got nothing to add, man. I'm, I'm with you on that one. I'm with you on that one. Yeah. But I, I guess, I guess the only thing that I, I won't add to it. The only, well, yeah, maybe that I'll add yeah. to it is, uh, sort of a parallel example, but but something a little bit different. So, um, Devin Brown, he's he's out in Western Canada. Uh, was a student of ours, owned a gym, still owns a gym. And it was, it specialized in obstacle course racing, preparing people for obstacle mm-hmm. course racing. Yeah. Well, that was cool. And his facility was doing really, really well until obstacle course racing ceased to be cool. Because, I mean, it was great. There was a good business. But if you're in like a reasonably small town in Western Canada and you've got a, a physical facility, um, to your point with like a business model, it's like, well, it's not a very good business model when that thing ceases to be cool, but he still loved it. And so the funny thing is like, he bought our certification and didn't use it. And then basically all of his business started to go away. Cause like I said, obstacle course racing, like kind of ceased to be cool and it wasn't in, in vogue. So we opened back up the textbook and applied it and like replaced all of his gym member revenue, almost you look at the charts, they're really interesting, but replaced most of his gym member revenue with online training revenue that was obstacle course racing, but it was just now we could reach a bigger market. Yep. And the coolest thing about this was that his gym now runs at basically a break even. It doesn't make any money, but it's just him and his buddies now. Yeah. That it's get fun. To, that is just fun. It's just or, pure fun for him. It takes the pressure off of the, the gym. Yes. You know, we've had clients to do to that. To have a good they, business model. They take them, on, take them online. It's like, oh, no, you know, hey, it's like, if you're going online, you and you want to keep the gym too, you better love the gym because right. everyone I know that goes online and has a gym too, like, I love them equally. No, you don't. Yeah. Cause when, when that online money comes in and you yeah. start and it's making more money than your gym and it's got low, less overhead and you're it's like 80% profit margin. Yeah. yeah and it's <laughs> like taking up almost none of your time in the gym. You got right. people complaining to you like, get me out of here. I, I got to get out of here. So I have to warn people that could happen. <laughs> it's, like, uh, it's like the minute somebody complains about the towels not being clean enough you're like no nah, i'm done <laughs> yeah i'm out of here i'm out of here what happened to me i was like i remember i remember the day that my online coaching business was making more than my gym i'm like what am i doing what am i doing with it's my just life? a pure like like mic drop just walk yeah. away right? <laughs> yeah yeah i i uh i i could have left better it could have been a better uh transition but you know that's that's uh being a young young man you'll tell me that story another day doing dumb shit yeah we <laughs> we gotta go we gotta go because you have uh you have places to be um so yeah where do people find out more about what you have going on yeah thanks man this was a fun conversation i'm glad we got to know each other a bit i've been looking yeah, forward to a lot of years if uh if anybody likes podcasts we've got the online trainer show it's fun it's irreverent it's lighthearted, but also lots of education Online Trainer Show, wherever you listen to podcasts, onlinetrainer.com slash podcast. If you want to become a certified online trainer, learn from the people who've been doing it the longest with the most amount of people, onlinetrainer.com slash academy, and it's called the Online Trainer Academy. You can Google, find like hundreds of reviews. Uh, But yeah, man, this is fun. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for coming on and sharing your wisdom. Got it. Appreciate it. See you.